The way that drug companies like Gilead, headquartered in Foster City, California, make their money is to convince the federal government, we will do a little give back here. We will offer drugs at a very low cost to these poor Africans. In return, we want the federal government to subsidize at enormous prices are the same drugs for American users of the chemicals. So Americans pay twelve to fourteen thousand dollars, but an individual doesn't really pay that money. It's subsidized through Medicare or Medicaid or AIDS um, drugs assistance program. In other words, some kind of federal entitlement program shovels ends up shoveling money into the treasury, into the corporate bank account of Gilead. It's a game they play, not just with AIDS drugs, by the way, not just with ARVs, but with all kinds of expensive drugs. That is, they're expensive because the companies jack up the prices because they know the U.S. government taxpayers will subsidize them. And then you were saying something about Chris, then I don't know. Yes. Well, my view is that the left and the right collude on this because the left basically says, well, we want to end this right-wing uh, restrictions on condom usage and what the Pope says about it. We want to end the right-wing restriction on needle exchanges because we want to save these people from HIV. The right-wing says, well, okay, we hate the sin, but we love the sinner. So we will help out these poor people and save them from themselves, particularly these black people in Africa. We will give them the, we'll arrange to give them these life-saving treatments. So the left and the right collude. They then come to the conclusion that they're doing some sort of charitable work, when indeed what they're doing is foisting the biggest fraud in medical history on black Africans, on African Americans, and on gay men. Uh, can you talk a little about um, Francois Barre? Do you Sanusi? know? Yeah, like what is it with her? Why is she okay. here? Well, Francois Barre Sanusi was the um, professional colleague of Dr. Luc Montagnier, who at the Institut Pasteur in the early 1980s was claimed to have isolated what he called the lymphadenopathy associated virus, which was later called with the name the human immunodeficiency virus. On this side of the Atlantic, Dr. Robert Gallo was doing similar research at the National Cancer Institute. Both of them had been trying for a dozen years to show some relationship of retroviruses, which were discovered and newly identified in around 1970, as having some relationship to cancer. They couldn't do it. They had wasted 12 years of work. So Montagnier does this research. They say they have um, isolated a retrovirus that could potentially have something to do with this new uh, gay disease. Gallo was emphatic. I found the retrovirus. It causes HIV. No question about it. Well, interestingly, in 1990, the last time this society met in the United States in San Francisco, Gallo said, I mean, Montagnier said, well, no, I've discovered that this retrovirus is not enough by itself to cause AIDS. There has to be cofactors. Well, he was pounced on, like Gallo said, no, that's crazy. HIV is just is enough by itself to cause it. Well, we go through the years. In 2006, Brent Leung in his documentary House of Numbers does hours and hours of interviews, including with Luc Montagnier. During the interview, Luc Montagnier says, without qualification, the body can rid itself of HIV in a few weeks if you have a good immune system. Totally antithetical to what the HIV AIDS establishment in the United States says. Once you got the virus in your body, you've got it forever. Montagnier was saying, no, that's not true. Natural immunity can take care of it. He has been ostracized ever since. Reporter for the Washington Post here yesterday says he's completely uh, irrelevant to the whole discussion. I spoke to Gallo. He was less emphatic because he doesn't want to be charged with being a sore loser because he did not get the Nobel Prize. He didn't get any part of it. So he just starts taking out after Montagnier and saying, well, you know, he's into this weird homeopathy and he wants to feed people um, some kind of special fruit in order to get rid of their AIDS. So in other words, they try to do everything they possibly can to marginalize the guy who got the Nobel Prize, along with Francois Barre Sanusi, who is strangely the incoming chairman for the next two years of the International AIDS Society. 
I'm very anxious to ask her what she thinks of her colleague Montagnier's view that the body can eliminate HIV from itself in a few weeks. That's true. We got her business card. Cause we yeah, I got that, and I, I, uh, it's in my phone now. And I uh, have wanted for years now to get in touch with Montagnier, but I, I think it's almost a, a impossible. He's about 77. Well, he's all over the place uh, doing his own stuff, like Gallo has his own, uh, both of them. Uh, he left Institut Pasteur, Gallo left the NIH under clouds of suspicion. Um, and um, they do their own work, but Gallo just beats up on Montagnier saying he's a crazy old man, basically. So would Fauci, so was the reporter for the Washington Post um, at the, where I asked him about Montagnier. Um, you know, you can't, even if you are a Nobel Prize winner who discovered HIV, you can't dissent from the HIV AIDS cult. It's not allowed. Just like I was almost not allowed as a denialist to come into this conference because I have questions about HIV and AIDS. Do you think we can force a dialogue with the mainstream here? We have been trying to create public discourse through mainstream media for 25 years. Since Peter Duisberg wrote his paper in Cancer, um, objecting to uh, questioning the uh, single pathogen theory. That was on March 1st, 1987. It's been 25 years and about three months since we attempted to begin some kind of re-examination of the single pathogen theory. The problem is the guy with the purse strings, Fauci, he hands out these grants. Nobody's gonna disagree publicly with Anthony Fauci because he's been for 28 years the guy who writes the check to you. Once again, I'll bet you that 80% of the people attending this conference can thank their expense accounts to Anthony Fauci directly or indirectly through grants to their colleges, to their nonprofits, um, through uh, their uh, NGOs around the world. Um, money talks, and money has silenced critics um, on the subject of HIV and AIDS. So you think if there's no money there, um, people will change their minds? Well, I mean, um, that's like saying if there's no oxygen, people can't breathe. Uh, I, I can't tell you what would happen over a period of time if that money started drying up, if we forced all of these uh, HIV AIDS parasites, as I call them, into honest work, doing some kind of scientific research that actually helps people rather than actually enforces harm on people. But you can bet if there were no money there for the drugs from the federal government, if there were no money there for the studies that Anthony Fauci funds in order to enforce this lie, uh, after a while, AIDS would disappear <laughs> because AIDS is a function of money. But don't you think we're kind of like feeding the machine by trying to make a debate, like we're drawing attention to AIDS that shouldn't be? Well, this conference is feeding the machine. This conference, I, mean, I could not hear, believe what I was hearing from some journalists and others yesterday at a panel here. AIDS is not getting enough attention. Well, Google HIV and AIDS and you'll see there's a new story every day around this planet. It's the most covered story in history. They were also saying, well, there's not enough money. <laughs> not enough money. In 30 years, the U.S. government has spent $370 billion on this lie and continues to throw money at this from the nonprofits and they call them non-governmental organizations in the rest of the world. They are raising hundreds of millions of dollars. Elton John, who was here, has raised tens of millions of dollars for the fraud. Um, Elizabeth Taylor, when she was alive, fronted this and raised tens of millions of dollars. No money? There, it's a wash in money. That's what keeps the myth alive. I'm curious about the statistic about how they say there's like 1.2 million HIV infected in America, but... The statistics, figures lie and liars figure. That's the old expression. There are huge numbers of liars figuring here. Let's take an example. The UN AIDS, the biggest liar <laughs> about numbers in the entire HIV AIDS industry, 
has claimed for the last 10 years that about 300,000 people die a year in South Africa, not Southern Africa, but the country South Africa from AIDS. We'll go to Statistics South Africa. They are the official keepers of census data, medical data, very good organization. See how many death certificates they claim have been issued for AIDS or HIV disease as they call it in South Africa the last 10 years. I've done that. I've looked at their annual report every year. It's someplace between 10 and 17,000. 300,000 versus 10 to 17,000. That is a 95% fabrication. That's how they lie. UN AIDS lies about the numbers so he can pump up its budget, so they can pump up the UN budget. The Americans lie about it so they can pump up the NIAIDS budget, the CDC budget. The nonprofits lie about it so they can raise more money. It's all about the money. Follow the money and you'll see where the numbers, the cooked books come from. You'll see where figures lie and liars figure when there's a dollar to be made out of it. You said NIAIDS, did you mean NIH's budget? NIAID is the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases, which is one of the National Institutes of Health. It's the one that Fauci runs. Sometimes you just say NIA grant, H grants, because it's the same thing. It is a subdivision of the NIH. The National Cancer Institute, where Gala worked, is a subdivision of the NIH. But can you address um, that number about a million in America? Yes. It's what it's been flatlined for 20 years, which makes it impossible to be an epidemic. An epidemic, when a new pathogen enters a population, the, here's how it goes. Over a few months, you will see an arc like this moving up, number of people infected. Then the body's natural immunity takes over. The people who haven't died or gotten sick get a natural immunity to it, and then it goes down like this. It's called a bell curve until it disappears. Unbelievably, HIV has done something no other disease has done, a communicable disease has done in history. It's begun on an arc like this, 1981 to about 1991, and then it started dropping off. And then the CDC starts redefining AIDS by T-cell counts, and then it levels out and goes like this and has ever since gone like that. That is not the trajectory of a communicable disease. So that's why for the last 20 years, they stick with the same number. There are a million people that have HIV AIDS and 20% of it don't know it, so that's really 1.2 million that have it. Same thing has been true uh, with the number of um, new infections each year. It's flatlined at 50,000 a year. Why? An orgy of testing. <laughs> you keep testing people for one of thousands of non-pathogenic retroviruses and you will find them. It was like H1N1. They started testing for H1N1 and they found a lot of it. If they wanted to test for one of 10,000 other viruses that might cause the flu, they could have tested for one of those and they could have jacked up the numbers. Figures lie and liars figure. But the um, amount they say uh infected every year is 50,000 in America and uh, less people are dying so would that add well, up Well, no, no. 50,000 a year new infections has nothing to do with death rate. The only claim they've been making for the last decade is that maybe 15 or, or 18,000 people a year die and of course they claim they're not dying because of the highly active antiretrovirals but that's just nonsense. But that you, wouldn't raise the total number of infected or whatever? every year. I mean, wouldn't that raise the amount of HIV positive total? Well, people die naturally of old age during this process. They die of other things. Understand they're just making numbers up so they can construct the numbers any way they want to construct the numbers. They just keep saying that there were a thousand, I mean, I mean a million people or a million point two people who have HIV hyphen disease. In other words, they always conflate HIV, the theoretical pathogen, with AIDS. But they define AIDS in such a broad way that, well, let me give you by example. In Canada, their version of the Centers for Disease Control, last figures available in 2009, 
in a country of 34 million people, was able to find 228 new cases of AIDS. That is 1,600% less corrected for population than the CD says, CDC says are in the United States. Why? Because we are the only country in the world that defines AIDS not by presenting illness, but by CD4 T cell counts. If you are unlucky enough to have a T cell count dropping below 200, and it's like taking your temperature, so you can happen at one time of the day you could have 200, another part of the day you could have 300, then you're said to have AIDS or HIV disease. Only country in the world that does that. Every other country says you have to be ill. So we just make up the numbers. If you can't make them up in, a, in one way, raising the number of opportunistic illnesses to 30 by 1992, make them up in another way. Now say you've got AIDS based on T cell counts. Approximately 80 to 90 percent of the new AIDS cases in the United States are not from illness but from CD4 T cell counts. That's why it is such madness to start feeding these toxic chemotherapies to people who have no presenting illness, which is what we've been doing for the last 15 years, which is why those gay men are having wasted faces, distended stomachs, thin limbs, chronic diarrhea, and eventually liver toxicity, kidney failure, heart attacks, and death. We killed them with the drugs, not with some mysterious pathogen. Um, I'm curious about people who, um you know, they don't believe HIV causes AIDS, and so they don't take the medicine, but then they get sick and die, like... Um, Everybody gets sick and dies. Well, like, uh, Eventually. I'm thinking of somebody in particular, uh, Emery Taylor, he got, they said it was like Kaposi sarcoma, but I don't know. Kaposi sarcoma was caused either by, only by poppers, which are carcinogenic. A lot of the Kaposi sarcoma was in the lung. <sighs> Dead. Uh, or it is possibly caused, I don't believe this, by another virus, the human herpes virus 8, HH, the uh, human herpes. Yes, um, that is an argument, that it was a, uh, a virus that was circulating in the gay community. I don't know. All I know is there is no chaos now. You hardly ever find a case, case of chaos now probably meaning dramatic reduction in the use of poppers. As for other diseases, um, 58,000 people or more die a year from pneumonia in this country. Uh, pneumonia occurs when you have a weakened immune system. There are only 18,000 people allegedly died from AIDS last year. How about those other 40,000? They died because People get sick and they die. People's natural immunity is affected by whether they're heavy drug users, alcohol. People who are alcoholics have impaired immune systems. By um, other diseases that people get that they can't handle, by um, malnutrition, by lack of proper sanitation, by lack of clean drinking water. I can give you a huge laundry list of things that can cause immune systems to be impaired. And it's just by coincidence, the person had a test for the set of proteins in his blood and was told that he had HIV. I will tell you, there is nothing like being telling some 20 something you have HIV. You, if you could find anything that would stress somebody out more, it's like the witch doctor bone pointing, you're going to die, many people do. When you, that's called the nocebo effect. When you make someone believe they have a lethal pathogen in their bodies, they will frequently get ill. That was what happened in the early 1980s in the gay community. People were panicking. They were afraid they were gonna die. People were committing suicide. That's a way to die. <laughs> um, it's just part of the figures lying and liars figuring um, that's being done. All right, that was good. Um, do you have anything you might want to add just to wrap I only want to add stress that the latest madness is pre-exposure prophylaxis. 
the idea that we ought to be feeding highly toxic chemotherapy to people who have never even tested reactive to the set of blood proteins that are called an HIV test, which by the way is no such thing. It's not a test for an active virus, as Montagne says when he says the body can rid itself of the virus in a couple of weeks. It is simply a, a test for a set of blood proteins. Those proteins can be caused by a hundred different bodily conditions called, and it's called cross-reaction. So what kind of madness is it to take these chemicals with their well-assessed damage to human health over the last 15 years and give it to people not only who have not been sick, but who do not even test reactive for these mysterious blood proteins. It is genocide.